Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Miriam Gray and I'm joining you live in the World Bank Group headquarters here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to everyone here in the audience and those around the world joining us online. The first half of 2022 has witnessed one of the largest shocks of global food and energy markets that the world had seen in decades. As countries rebounded from COVID pandemic, supply chains struggled to keep up with increasing demand for food and energy and put pressures on prices. The war in Ukraine intensified the record high food and energy prices and triggered global crisis that will drive millions more into extreme poverty, magnifying hunger and malnutrition. Food and energy crises are particularly devastating for the poorest and most vulnerable people. Despite the recent stabilization of agriculture prices and resumption of grain export from the Black Sea, high food inflation, energy and food security remain a critical concern. In the face of these challenges, leaders from around the world are meeting here to discuss these impacts and how to shape solutions that can bring stronger, safer and more prospered communities. Today, we will be looking at how to build resilience to overlapping crises with a comprehensive and coordinated effort to align incentives, accelerate innovation, and scale up investments. And you can follow this event in several languages. We are streaming in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic at live.wallbank.org and also on our social media channels. Let's take a look at what's coming up over the next hour. You can see we have many interesting discussions coming up. And to start, the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpass, has invited two guests, Her Excellency Anna Tverenheim, Minister for International Development of Norway, and Mustafa Terab, Chairman and CEO of the OCP Group, a leading global fertilizer provider, to discuss how policy measures and incentives could help address the impacts of compounding energy and food crisis. Over to you, David. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you both for joining. And we're, we're going, the, our goal is to have a conversation about food and fertilizer and energy. Uh, and, uh, and we recognize the, the world is in a difficult place on all three right now. We've been doing, World Bank has uh, put out puts out a lot of diagnostics or data on, uh, uh, on the situation of world food markets, fertilizer markets, uh, and we've been having other events during the day today. So I, I want to turn straight into the conversation with you. <clears throat> and you, as uh, uh, Norway is very involved in this in multiple ways. You've experienced a drought this year, which reduces your electricity production. You, your energy production is more valuable. Uh, and you also, I know you personally think a lot about how food can be produced in developing countries. So could you update us on the energy situation, maybe in, in Norway, but also in Europe as a whole? How are you thinking about it, and what, what are the changes going on? Well, you know, um, all countries need to uh, enter into an energy transformation. And of course, the, the big uh, worry now is that the current situation will uh, inhabit that, uh, that transition. And I'm particularly concerned about developing countries, whether they will be able to, you know, both reach the affordability and the, the uh, availability uh, of, 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 uh, of energy consumption that they need, uh, but in a sustainable way. Um, so I, I have decided to believe that this crisis will be an opportunity both for Europe, for the Western world and for developing countries to fast track that energy transformation. Um, will uh, that work out in practice? Well, that, that depends on certain, certain things. First of all, access to finance. 
especially in developing countries. And we see the tendency that investors are becoming more risk adverse. Um, we know that the fiscal space for many countries is uh, limited. Uh, the transition pace may slow down, so the jury is still out, but I have decided to be an optimist, and there are things that we could do. Now, in terms of the developing world, for example, um, as a Minister of International Development, I control the ODA. We can use the ODA a lot smarter uh, in order to, um, to unlock private capital by uh, ensuring guarantee schemes. MIGA is in, uh, in the World Bank is a great example of that, thinking out of the box. Um, we have recently uh, established a climate investment fund in Norway, 10 billion uh, Norwegian crowns for um, de-risking private capital. Um, so, um, so basically, I think there is um, uh, there's a lot of hope to speed up the transition given that we are able to unlock that private capital, and we can do a lot more to do that with ODA money. We, we talked about this summit when I met in Copenhagen with you and, and colleagues, and so as we think about de-risking, one of the challenges uh, that, that we grapple with, and, uh, and I know you do, is uh, how do you measure the risk of uh, projects and how do you share the, the, the burden of the de-risking costs? Um, it, g g g so you work with... Uh, the Norwegian private sector in their investments abroad. How do you think about the risk profile of those companies? Well, that's always a balance. Of course, we don't only work with Norwegian uh, private business. Okay. Uh, any so private capital fund, is ten, welcome. <laughs> your 10 billion uh, krona fund is primarily to de-risk for Europe. European companies or how, how any you, companies, any, companies any private capital working willing to go into projects uh, where we can um, uh, uh, change fossil fu uh, produ uh, energy produ production based on fossil fuel with uh, renewable sources uh, is eligible. And, uh, and um, uh, what we see is that there is a lot of interest, maybe a little bit risk adversity now. Uh, and so I need to find that balance where we, um, uh, where we risk enough with our ODA money, but at the same time uh, attracting the private capital. Yeah. And that will vary, of course, uh, from country to yeah. country. And we, we work hard on that to catalyze. So what is it that we're doing that allows or increases the amount of, uh, of investment that goes in? I, 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 I don't know, Mustafa, you, you, so you, you may be a, this may be a client uh, for you. you Tell us about your business. We, we met in Morocco and uh, had a very interesting conversation uh, that, that I know you are very involved in Morocco, but throughout Africa. So just go through some of the dynamics that are going on right now. Fertilizer is in short supply. We've had meeting after meeting. I met uh, in New York two weeks ago with President Macron and a, and a big group to talk about specific fertilizer bottlenecks. Give us some color and context sure. for that problem. Yes, uh, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I, I really believe in this case, the putting things in context is very important because there is a visible crisis today, a shortfall of fertilizer, but uh, we should recognize that what's visible today has been revealed by a crisis, but it's based on a long-term uh, situation that we have to address. And the long-term situation is a great imbalance between production of fertilizer and what the world needs in terms of fertilizer. Put things again in perspective, one half of food production today is due to the use of uh, fertilizers, of mineral fertilizers. So it is really critical that we have availability of those fertilizers. And if you recall, prices of fertilizers started increasing before the, 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 the war, before the present war. Two, three years ago, already we saw this imbalance between supply and demand impact heavily prices. So, you know, if there is a, an opportunity in the crisis, as the minister suggested, it is really to address not only the short-term uh, imbalance, and indeed, 
the critical continent is Africa, uh, because this is where the shortfall is uh, tremendous and immediate impact could be the worst. Uh, we're, as an African producer of fertilizer, doing our part in making uh, next year available 4 million tons of fertilizer for the African farmer uh, at the right price because we're also customizing fertilizer for the food and the soil, for the, the plant and the soil in Africa. Tell, tell, tell us a little basics about your business. So in Morocco, there's phosphate, but you need natural gas uh, in other parts of Africa, so you're both a producer of fertilizer and a distributor. T tell us some about it. Yes, I mean, fertilizers basically are made of two nutrients, three, but uh, two main nutrients, which is nitrogen made out of natural gas and phosphate. Morocco has the largest reserves of, of phosphate, but doesn't have natural gas. So we import the nitrogen fertilizer that we blend with the phosphate part to make the compound fertilizer. And what I was mentioning, the customization means not doing a one-size-fits-all type of fertilizer, but customizing and adapting the fertilizer to the conditions of the soil and the plant. The advantage there is that we not only reduce uh, environmental degradation, because we, are make, we make sure that the plant, that the quantity of nutrients we put is fully absorbed by the plant and the soil, but not surprisingly, those fertilizers that have even more impact in terms of productivity are sometimes half the price of the uh, standard fertilizer. So uh, the four million tons I mentioned for Africa, which to put in perspective, Africa consumes today five million tons of phosphate-based fertilizer. So four million tons is about 80% of the demand these are, we can provide at cheaper prices because it's customized fertilizer. Mm -hmm. In a way, Africa is innovating before other continents in this respect. Yes, but this is a global phenomenon of better use of fertilizer is a critical factor in, cl in cl climate, in environmental issues, and it's one that's been difficult for countries to do. The World Bank's been very involved in that in, in uh, China, in India, of having more efficient use of fertilizer and more appropriate use. But you, you would say you're cutting edge in Africa by, by tailoring the fertilizer to the soil and the, and the crops that are being needed. Absolutely. It is, a, in a way, you know, innovating and using high tech, you know, high tech to do this. It's satellite imagery, first to know what the content of the, the soil in terms of nutrient is in real time, and then formulating the fertilizer that addresses that particular information. I'll come back to Anne. And yeah, thoughts on, on f food in particular and how do we get more food in Africa? Obviously, uh, fertilizer is part of it, but also the, 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 the financing that you mentioned. Wonderful. Thoughts? Uh, and if I may just quickly revert to your question, because I didn't really touch much upon Europe, but this is a good bridge from you know, explaining this perfect storm that's hitting the world. Um, as you mentioned, in, in Norway, we've been uh, facing a, well, not a drought, but the, we uh, rely on hydroelectric power in Norway, and we have um, reservoirs, water reservoirs that are really below the minimal level. Um, at the same time, we export gas to Europe as much as we can due to the current situation. Uh, gas in Europe is traditionally used a lot for m producing energy, Obviously, with those prices, we end up exporting hydroelectric power instead from Norway. So it really is, you know, uh, a combined, uh, uh, really difficult situation. And then, with the gas prices, we see, for example, Yara, which is a big Norway, Norwegian-based uh, fertilizer producer, has shut down several factories in Europe because it's simply not enough. Uh, it's simply not possible to 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 push that extra cost to the customer. Now. What is deeply disturbing, and what this week will, will, uh, we will discuss this week, is that at the moment we are facing a food price crisis. That can be fixed with money, with logistics. However, due to the fertilizer crisis, in one season 
we will not have we will not produce enough food in the world to feed everyone. Now that's an unprecedented situation. We have never seen it before. That's over the 12 months starting now. Well, or? it depends on the seasons around the world. I, I'm, I'm not an agronomist. So, so in general, the food the world is at a food deficit, which is rare, or Every maybe a few months. Uh huh. Yes, uh, I believe. If we now go to um, Africa, which is possibly the continent most har uh, hardly hit, we must remember the small-scale producers. You know, um, uh, some 80 percent of the food consumed in developing countries is produced by the smallest producers. Worldwide, 30 to 35 percent of the global food consum consumption comes from farms below two hectares. So we need to get fertilizers and improved seeds out there. And we need to prepare these farmers for a new climate, a changing climate, uh, with um, um, making sure that they get access to uh, smart agronomies, climate smart production methods, mm -hmm. um, uh, low tech mechanization and finance. And you know we have we have the knowledge. We just need to get it out there. Um, and I've decided to see this also as an opportunity. I come straight from Addis Ababa, where the African um, ministers of agriculture met to discuss this very this very topic. And you know they say we are we are in a food crisis. At the same time, Africa is importing 56 billion US dollars worth of food from other continents every year. While at the same time, they have 65% of the world's left arable land. So, you know, this is also an opportunity to um, make Africa the, the breadbasket that they should be. One uh, quite follow on. Um, so, Yara, you mentioned Yara not producing in Europe. So, then where is Europe getting its fertilizer? It's well, even Norwegian farmers are finding it hard to hard. to actually invest putting the grains into the soil because it simply is not it's not worth the while. Um, so, but but of course there is still there is still fertilizer out there, but it's very very expensive. So, Mustafa, how, so it, is there a connection to Europe? Do, do you feel the change in the European fertilizer situation in your businesses? So if Europe's not producing fertilizer and not planning to plant as many crops, yep. uh, it, does that ring true? And, and uh, wh how is it affecting Africa? Well, it, it impacts Africa because Africa is still importing uh, about half the fertilizer is using. And mm. keep in mind that the, the need for Africa, which consumes, say, from 5 to 10 million tons, actually it's 30 million tons. If we want to address the global food security challenge that the, the Honorable Minister mentioned, we have to change the mind, our mindset about Africa, in a way. Mm. You know, we think of food security in Africa, Africa being the locus of where food insecurity is. But we have to think long term Given the, 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 the figures, you know, 60% of arable land unused in the world is in Africa, yeah. that, that Africa is going to be a solution, or at least yeah. part of the solution that for means global... Small farms, food. that means finance, that means uh, choice of crops and choice of mm -hmm. fertilizer, efficiency from that standpoint. I would add trade, liberaliza trade facilitation, which the World Bank is trying to do, meaning one country may be able to make extra of a certain kind of food or, uh, or fertilizer, uh, and it, trading that with neighbors is a really important part of the, of the efficiency yeah. process if yes. that can work out. And, you know, we have a big, at World Bank, wa water practice because water is, uh, I, when, when Mustafa, you, you said uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 fertilizer is 40, you had 45% of the input to crops with, I s it, it's what? actually half the food half production. Of, half of food production is attributed to for the use of fertilizer. And then another part would be the seeds. Another part would be the water, and so on down the the tractors and the uh, mechanization that might be needed. And so fertilizer is the biggest component. Uh, would you think? 
It must well, be. It, it is, but uh -huh. it, it's not uh, enough. Mm. I mean, when I mentioned, we have to rethink what the green revolution in Africa uh -huh. has to mm. be. It cannot look like other green revolutions. It has to be small landholder fo focused, mm. but even the way we produce fertilizer and use them has to be very different from, from other green revolutions. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I would just want to add that you cannot customize fertilizer if you're simply importing them. So investing in fertilizer production in Africa I is also going to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And making the rich, back to uh, the, my first comment, renewable energy, making sure that rural areas, food production areas, get access to um, small scale uh, renewable energy. Because we also know that there's a huge food loss due to uh, lacking infrastructure, lacking uh, cool chains, etc. And you know, uh, the technology is out there, it's becoming so cheap, solar power, wind power, uh, and, and it can easily be scaled up um, uh, for access for small-scale farmers around Africa. Uh, exactly right. So, uh, background on World Bank programs, as you know, we've uh, we we have a big effort on direct aid now, given the crisis. So, a 30 billion dollar uh, allocation uh, for for food that goes to food systems, mm -hmm. which goes heavily into uh, less waste, uh, but also more rationalization of the food systems. Uh, and so th that we're, we've done a, a sizable program in East Africa, where they're facing. Uh, real f famine or uh, dr dr drastic food shortages, uh, and as well as in m m several other parts of Africa, uh, and and that's ongoing as we uh, as the uh, as the shortages become apparent. I'm really concerned by and what you were saying about the uh, uh, it, you know your projections are one year forward that there's l less food. Well, let me observe, uh, you know, there is sizable amounts of food in storage in some countries. Sure. So to bridge that gap, sure. one thing will be more production and doing it sooner rather than later. And another will be uh, drawing on, on uh, uh, stored food. China is one of the big stores. There's also heavy storage in, in India, in the U.S. and other that can help bridge some of that gap in, in over the next year. Mm. Um, I know they're, they're trying to flag us here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. David and his guests for this conversation, but before, we go, before you go, we actually have audience questions we've received. Um, our audience has been posting questions online and throughout this broadcast. Uh, Mateus Miranda from Portugal sent us this video. Huh. How is Norway, for example, supporting climate resilient food systems? Where is the main focus? Let me repeat the question. Madam Minister, this would be for you. How is Norway supporting uh, climate resilient food systems and what is the main focus? That's a great question and uh, it relates to agriculture all over the world. All farmers have to adapt to a new climate, but we know that it's, uh, it's most urgent for small scale farmers self-subsistence uh, farmers that have no uh, security net whatsoever. So uh, what we are doing is, for example, through several, several years we have supported the uh, GAFS, the uh, Global Agriculture and Food Security Program through the World Bank. Um, uh, FAO has some interesting work on climate action in agriculture, and it's really all about changing ag uh, uh, agronomy, ag agricultural practices. It is about research into, for example, seed varieties, more uh, uh, heat tolerant seeds for wheat, uh, rice varieties that can tolerate more salinity, etc. Some great works being done. As I mentioned, low tech mechanization um, in order to not disturb the soil so much so that it doesn't lose so much humidity. Um, and as I also mentioned, getting access to renewable energy so that you get um, less food waste, yeah. less food loss. That's a, that's a strong list. I'm glad you mentioned GAFs. Uh, so w w that's part of our information systems at, at the bank and our program systems. And I was happy the U.S. Uh, the, the US this morning uh, um, uh, confirmed or, or uh, their, their direct contrib contribution to GAFSB. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a 
program that, that has wide uh, uh, acceptance and support. But we have one more question okay. from the audience, if that's okay. Uh, let's just listen. Um, the next one actually is coming from Brazil. Rafael Naguera. Huh. How can we bring innovation that can revolutionize the fertilizer um, sector? Yeah. Mustafa, can I ask, uh, add to that? How can we uh, innovate and revolutionize? And can you mention ammonia in that? Sure. Uh, look, I, I, just, I mentioned we, we need a rethink of uh, how fertilizers are produced and are used in, in, in a sense, uh, you know, what the industri fertilizer industry has called the four R's. Use, making sure we use the right fertilizer at the right time for the right soil at the, at the right rate, mm. which means, in a way, customizing at the local level. So best practices are going to become very local, mm. and that's good news for, for, for this small landholder. How do we do that is daring to innovate. And technology is global, but innovation is always lo mm -hmm. uh, local. And the good news is it has already happened, in, in, for example, in Africa. We don't think about it, but 20 years ago, the, the, there's already been an African revolution that didn't take the path of other revolutions, which is the telecom one. Mm. And Africa dared to go mobile from the outset. I see uh, former colleagues here that were part of it. The World Bank and IFC were a big part of that revolution in Africa. And if you think about it, it was courageous at the time. It was deciding that African countries would not use the same path of development of the telecom sector as other countries. Namely, no need to increase landline uh, density. Let's go mobile from the outset. And a lot of innovation came out of that. Mobile payment didn't start with Apple Pay, but with M-Pesa in, in, in Kenya, etc. And what's the leapfrog on fertilizer? The, the idea of it being precisely tailored to the needs? The, the technology is here. Uh -huh. It's just daring to, to do it. So it takes investors and IFC to de-risk that, but also government policies that enable that innovation. Yeah. And the, that's where the World I, Bank can be I, very I think this, this is huge. As you're saying, there was a green revolution that was so important in India and in feeding the world in, uh, d decades ago. Uh, but as we look at it now, combining digital capabilities and even satellite capabilities and, and uh, making more granular the, the, the map for fertilizer mm -hmm. can have huge efficiency gains. And it's already proven. That's in many countries, super. Yes. Ethiopia and other places, uh, that, we've done it. Thank you very much. What do we do? Thank you so much. Thank you, David and his guests. Uh, thank you for those answers to the audience in the room and online. Please continue to post your questions at life.worldbank.org. Meanwhile, we have several experts standing by to answer those questions in English, Spanish, French and Arabic, and they are replying to as many as possible. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and use hashtag foodfuelforall to share your thoughts and that discussion and for those to come. We are also inviting you to take a part in a special poll. The question we are asking today is, which of these um, you think contributed most to the global food and energy shocks? Is it A, supply chain issues, B, the war in Ukraine, C, extreme weather events, uh, D, exchange rate volatility, or E, all of the above? You can cast your vote now at live.worldbank.org live and we'll bring you results at the end of this event. With those issues in mind, let's take a look at how shortages of food and fuel are affecting day-to-day -day existence of communities whose lives already been severely impacted by recent events. Bado tuko na mifugo sinaangalia kwa kiangazi. Sasa hiyo challenge mingi tunapitia. Hata ngombe sasa hizi nakufa. Hata na bado watu wanakata kitu kama siku mbili kama tatu kama wachakula. Mambo ya stima, 
kitambo ulikuwa nalipa ukiweka kama 200 ya token unaona umekupeleka au mosta month kwa saa hii pia stima zimeenda juu ukiweka 50 bob ni hiyo siku kesho yake inaanza kuitisha kuriaria Leo hivi ona maita maingi turahuthira kando kuona nyumba na ona ndikugite na thina cases nyingi muno tondu miaki ni iragwata muno riu guko manyumba ini mtoto awezi akasoma vizuri manake hakuna pesa na stima imeenda juu kini kwa saa hii imeaffectiwa kwa kabisa kwa sababu venye tunanunua sio hivyo venye tulikuwa tunanunua mbereni kwa sababu sasa imepanda bei kwa sababu ya transport haya kuuza kuuza huyu customer mwenye unauzia Une heure de coupure dans notre secteur d'activité, c'est réellement catastrophique. Notre spécialité, c'est les produits frais. Pas d'électricité, c'est donc un produit qui est mal conservé et cela occasionne de nombreuses pertes. Pues muy fam... programa nos ha apoyado eh, más que todo con conocimientos técnicos y eh, con la facilidad al adquirir algunos productos. Para la compra de insumos, tanto fertilizantes, insecticidas, herbicidas, todo, para manejar el cultivo de la mejor forma, para ser productivo, ese rubro en, su, en el momento adecuado. La mayor parte de los comunarios nos dedicamos a la producción, ya que sembrábamos maíz, yuca, frijol, pero con este tema de la sequía se nos fue la producción abajo. Que todo a mí me emociona porque yo la verdad nunca sembré papa, es la primera vez que he sembrado y veo de que es un fruto muy bueno. El juicio eso muchas veces nos ha tocado hasta estar sin luz más que todo por el tema económico, ¿no? De que no hay. Pero yo creo que ahora con esta función de riego que nosotros tenemos ya no vamos a llegar a eso. Vamos a producir con más ganas y le vamos a echar más ganas, ¿no? Hi, I'm Neda Amin in Khartoum, Sudan. And you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Animal Meetings. I'm joined here by our panel guests, but before we introduce them, I would like to, uh, to look at the latest data which underscores the importance of the discussion we've been having today. Let's take a look at the screen now and see how the prices of essential commodities changed as a result of the shocks we've been discussing. Let's start with the cost of energy, which includes coal, oil, gas prices. Uh, comparing January to September 2021 with the same period in 2022, there's been a dramatic 76% increase in the cost of energy. What about food prices? We know that overlapping global crises have affected the supply of essential staples. Taking those same periods again in 2022 and 2021, the cost of food went up, to, up by 21%. And lastly, let's take a look at the price of uh, fertilizer. This is vital for boosting agricultural productivity. Here we've seen the largest uh, global increase of all uh, shocking, 97% rise in just a year. Now to speak more about this and uh, discussion specific solutions on how to transition to clean energy and resilient food system that are vital to protect people and the planet. Let me introduce our guests in studio today. Let's welcome Axel van Trossenburg, World Bank Group uh, Managing Director of Operations. Thank His you. Excellency Sida Keita, Minister of Finance from Gambia. <coughs> Jo Swinnen, Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute. And Arania Almashad, 
Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. Uh, let's just straight, go straight into it. It's a lot of ground to cover. Axel, my first question is to you. We've been discussing, obviously, a lot today, but um, let's just talk about the role of the bank, the World Bank, that, uh, you know, that we are playing, and uh, how, what are we doing to respond to food and energy shocks? Well, first of all, I think these uh, shocks are coming now on top of a world that is in a state of shock, because we have been barely coming out of the COVID crisis. Then you have uh, the war in, um, in Ukraine and the enormous fo uh, uh, fallout. So uh, countries have a real hard time because this multitude of, of crises is cumulative and having uh, therefore such a great impact on this. What the World Bank has been doing is particularly, what I will say is, the times are difficult, but we are determined in action. In action is that you need to act on this uh, very quickly to provide the necessary support. And what does that mean? In the agricultural sector, it cannot only be, unquote, band-aid, that you just uh, give the money and then hope for the best. What you will need to say is, ca can we provide packages that help to alleviate the short term, particularly in the food uh, uh, security area, but at the same time also work much more on the resilience agenda. How can countries becoming more resilient against future crises? And that is a comprehensive, that can be on storage facilities, can be also in the agriculture. It is the whole value chain that needs to be considered. And that is where, where we then are, are providing support. And what you are seeing is we are providing individual country support or secondly, also regional support, because uh, some of the uh, uh, challenges are similar in the region. So, for, uh, for example, in the Africa region, we are providing their sub-regional programs that are dealing with food security challenges. What is also more is that the countries need a lot of resources, and therefore what we have said in, in, in this context, we need to give an indication that the bank stands uh, ready to do whatever it takes to provide uh, 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 financial support. So we have announced that we are co could put a financial package uh, on the table up to $30 billion. How does that consist? Of new operations up to $12 billion and 18 billion of existing operations that we can't partly restructure and also adjust to the needs of, of, of the day. Um, and we have started the implementation. As we speak, we have uh, committed over $6 billion. That is good, but basically what it is, the World Bank is only one part of an ecosystem of support. So we see ourselves as part of a coalition that can be on the bilateral side and multilateral side. So we are working with also other multilateral organizations, particularly of the UN system, be it at the FEO, be it particularly those are very action-oriented, like the World Food Program or UNICEF, to provide that support. So I think what we can do, we can uh, mitigate uh, uh, this, but I think a lot more needs to be done. I think these annual meetings are good for one person. It is, again, attracting attention, putting the finger that we need to act on it. We cannot leave countries behind because of this crisis. And we need to be aware that uh, if we don't act, we are seeing an increase in poverty, which we unfortunately, if you are looking at the latest poverty report, sees that extreme poverty is increasing by uh, as we has, uh, have, uh, have estimated, by 70 million. And if we don't act, it will get worse. So it is now the time to act, and we need to do it immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Um, my next question is for Minister Kita. Minister, um, is, uh, Axel just said, actually, Gambia is also working a lot with the bank, and there are lots of, um, actually several, innovative energy product projects. Um, can you tell us how these are helping to mitigate energy price spikes and strengthen both food and energy security for Gambian people? And what are the measures that are taken by the government to aid the energy sector against the rising uh, fuel prices? Thank you very much. Uh, Gambia is a net energy importer. We import all our energy needs, and the spike in the price of energy, as well as food, had left an untold challenge 
on both the government and the population of the Gambia. It has put a stress on our fragile economy and with the intervention of the World Bank, we have been able to invest in a mix of energy that support the energy roadmap, which overall will consist of the alternative energy production. Uh, we also have the regional power supply from Senegal, as well as the existing hydrocarbon power production. That, on completion, will reduce the overall energy mix and the subsequent price reduction. Uh, the shock has not been very easy on the population and the government treasury for that matter. Uh, we were obliged to sub subsidize the price of fuel to the tune of 1.5 billion in the last seven months, which translates to about $30 million to cushion the impact of the society. Uh, that notwithstanding, it left a big go gap in our fiscal space, but we felt it was necessary as a government in order to ameliorate the shock or the, the pressure on the population. The other areas of intervention that we have done as a government is to partner with the World Bank to subsidize the cost of living of the most vulnerable segment through cash transfers. That came in very handy and supported the most vulnerable segment of society in the rural community. So these are some of the measures we have taken as a country. But overall, we can say that uh, the intervention of partners like the World Bank has supported a large investment in energy sector, which we believe upon completion, we will attain global energy sufficiency by 2035. That is the energy roadmap. It is a challenge. It is, we are not out of the woods yet, and we still believe that uh, we need to partner more with development partners in order to weather the storm. Thank you. One follow-up question, Minister. We have received a question from the audience. Let's see. Recent events such as COVID and the war in Ukraine have shown just how vulnerable the global fuel supply chain could be. How can we enhance the resilience of the sector, especially in the face of growing disaster risk? Yes, I think going forward, the only formula is resilience. And to build so, you need a multiple approach. One way is the trading, sec the trading system in the energy. As we know, energy is, is mainly traded through uh, key producers, and they are operating as OPEC. And we need to have more supply side coming onto the market so as to increase the supply side in order to make sure that it's the, it's the fair market price that everybody is paying. Today, even if the supply and demand mechanism works such that the price should go down, we'll see production cuts from OPEC as is happening now. The other approach will be to increase this storage capacity. Small and developing countries like Gambia do not have enough storage capacity and cannot benefit from economies of scale of buying the product in large capacity, in large volumes when the prices are low. A third approach will be the use of financial markets. Because as you know, oil, oil is a traded commodities. The developing countries should be supported to develop the necessary financial tools to hedge against the rise of commodity, uh, oil prices. These three combinations, we believe, will adequately address and reposition uh, developing countries to face the growing uh, challenge of energy. And as I mentioned, the only way forward is resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Your policy question for you. So um, from your perspective, what are the key policy solutions that countries should be implementing now to address food security concern and build resilience to future shocks? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's as, as several speakers have already emphasized, what we're dealing with is a systems question and a long run, a long run problem. I mean, food security has declined since 2015 already. 
uh, the price spikes, if we, could, we talked about the price shock in 2007, 2008, but since then we've had 2011, 12, now before uh, Ukraine and after Ukraine. So the, the shocks are the nor new normality. So you need a system, a policy system that addresses that. That means you need a package of policies to address various aspects, but you also need short-term responses, medium-term and long-run. And so we don't have enough time to go through all of that, but let me emphasize maybe a, a few. I think in the short run, what we should be focused on uh, is basically providing financial resources for uh, humanitarian aid, clearly, but also domestically for di targeted social protection programs. I think particularly paying attention to gender issues because we know that women and children are most affected to that. Keeping trade open is really important. I mean, uh, working with countries which have introduced export constraints, for example, and then also market intelligence is really important. Information that helps all the actors in the food chain to make the right decision, but also for governments to make the right policy choices. I think in the long run, you can, again, many things, but maybe let me point out three. One is innovation, the other one is finance, and the third one, is um, sustainable production and healthy consumption. Let me start with the last one, okay? We really, for the future, to make our system, our transformation work, we, we cannot separate these things out anymore. Healthy diets and sustainable production have to go together. We have to come in a broad strategy on this. On the finance, I think we need a new food finance architecture that includes innovations in different parts of the world, private sector, public sector, one issue there is the repurposing agenda. We have $700 billion spent every year on agricultural subsidies. We have to rethink those, bring them more in line with healthy diets and sustainable production. And then the last point is on innovation. One is new innovations, but you know, there's so much tech technology that are available, people are just not using them, either because they, they don't have the incentive to use them or because they cannot, they have uh, problems with insurance, with access to capital. So all these things need to be addressed. Let me leave it at that. Thank you. Rania, so the war in Ukraine has threatened food security across the world, and Egypt is unfortunately not an exception. So we work a lot with the Egypt, um, the bank, and uh, it'd be good to hear from you what is the government working on to mitigate the impact and increase the agricultural resilience of Egypt? Well, Thank you very much, and uh, uh, just a few uh, comments on Egypt. Uh, when we were here during the uh, spring meetings, uh, all the writings uh, showed that there was a sense of panic around Egypt, uh, being one of the biggest uh, wheat importers, particularly from uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and we had to underscore that it's a shock, but not a panic. Uh, and this comes on the back of uh, preemptive measures that the government took several years earlier. Uh, for example, investing in silos for wheat storage. That was not the case before 2014. Now we have it across uh, different parts of the country. Played an extremely important role in storing wheat. Uh, it wasn't in anticipation of the war, but that was, uh, uh, became regular practice. The second was increasing agricultural land uh, for wheat production. So actually half of what uh, we consume is locally produced. Uh, creating incentives for farmers uh, trying to uh, increase the yield. So again, some of the policies that uh, Joe mentioned uh, as well. Uh, reform is a continuous process for any country. Uh, in our case, uh, trying to uh, look at uh, uh, the storage capacity, improve uh, the yield, uh, and widen the uh, agricultural uh, land for wheat production was extremely fundamental. When the shock happened, uh, nonetheless, there had to be uh, social safety nets for those mostly uh, uh, affected by uh, the food increase because wheat was one, but then you also had fuel, you had food, so the, 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 the inflation impact was quite, uh, was quite sizable. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is where targeted policy comes in. And let me say that uh, uh, because we've already had uh, programs and projects with the bank, such as uh, you know, ones related to social solidarity, making sure that the social safety nets are uh, uh, you know, well targeted, uh, digitized, that also helped tremendously uh, in making uh, these, uh, um, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the social safety net expansion uh, much easier. That happened in COVID, and it also happened 
uh, during uh, uh, the uh, or the fallout of uh, of the crisis. Uh, the other uh, important aspect, and let me just uh, mention adaptation and resilience uh, in light of Egypt being the president of COP coming up uh, next month in Sharm el Sheikh. And uh, two key messages uh, for us at COP, uh, adaptation and resilience are extremely important, and the war has shown this, uh, that we do need to increase uh, the investments in uh, agricultural projects and try and see uh, you know, crop-resilient uh, uh, production. Uh, something else uh, is from pledges to implementation. Here comes the point on financing, uh, and it's very important also uh, that uh, public money, whether it's from the MDBs uh, or... Uh, uh, other sources uh, needs to try and leverage private sector investment in agriculture and water. And we're trying to provide examples of that because, uh, you know, uh, MDBs put together would only uh, be able to uh, fulfill 4% of total climate financing needs globally. And so to leverage on the private sector, there needs to be uh, also a focus uh, on uh, innovative financing instruments. And that is another uh, important message that we're bringing to COP as well. Yo, actually, let's pick up, um, I want to go back to the point you made. Uh, let's talk about research and innovation. So in your capacity, what do you think research, what the role research can play in guiding the countries through the crisis response? Yeah, the, um, we've been doing a lot of thinking about this because I work for a research organization, both IFPRI here in DC and in, or headquartered in DC, and the CGIR more broadly. And so again, uh, we have, uh, I think the long-term strategy really has to focus on, on the resilience agenda, climate change, big time in there, but also on, on productivity, reduction of food loss and waste, etc. We have come up with a seven action uh, item uh, crisis response, okay, where again, since uh, the, the, the problems are, the solutions to the problem, I think, include some form of technology and innovation, part is institutions, institutional change, and part of is the policy agenda, and so our package of seven is really addressing each of these things. For example, I think one of the things we really have to look into is, is uh, fertilizer and soil fertility, means part of a, there's a policy issue, trade and fertilizer, fertilizer subsidies, etc. But part of it is also a technology issue and, and not just on the fertilizer thing. I mean, we, there's a lot of potential room, we think, of using fertilizers more efficiently. But there is also a lot of room for improving other types of management practices so that we use less traditional fertilizers to use. Okay, so we have this seven point. Uh, I don't think I, you want me to go through all, all the seven points, but I'm, I'm more than happy to go into detail on it. Part of this poli evidence-based policy in crisis frameworks, etc. And for example, the AMIS, which is a, a part of developed in the A20, G20, sorry, it's the agricultural market information system, really fits very much in what we do, making that better digital-based, real-time, etc. So, a number of these things. Rania, in just a few weeks, as you mentioned, Egypt is hosting COP27, big forum, and we're really mm -hmm. looking forward to it. Um, can you please speak a little more about the main objectives? You did mention two messages, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the global ac action that you hope uh, this forum will inspire. And also, especially when it comes to innovative solutions uh, that are needed for green and resilient development going forward. Um, I think one of the uh, uh, key uh, points, despite the global uh, backdrop, which is a very challenging one, and you know, it's uh, for for all the meetings we're attending, uh, uh, the compounded crises of COVID and uh, and 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 prices of fuel, food, etc., uh, sort of weigh a little bit uh, uh, on uh, on different messaging. Uh, nonetheless, one uh, very important message is that climate and development should not be seen as separate objectives. They need to come hand in hand. And if there's that realization, uh, we will be able to uh, avail financing for development projects which have climate action at their heart, be it water treatment projects, be it uh, solar or wind farms, so agricultural projects, etc. So it's, it's very important that uh, that this notion become more mainstream uh, because uh, uh, private companies, when they're trying to look for uh, pro places to invest, uh, we also need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the, the projects which are presented to them have this 
uh, uh, synergy and this interlinkage is uh, uh, more clear. Uh, finance is going to be very important uh, during COP. Uh, of course, we have the 100 billion, uh, which uh, you know uh, we can sit down and argue uh, how much we are deviating from it, but we know we're short. Um, and uh, in order to uh, move from uh, you know billions to trillions, or see the trillions that were uh, committed in Glasgow making their way to the projects, uh, we also need to think innovatively of different uh, ways to capitalize. Uh, on this uh, private sector willingness to come into countries. Uh, and so this is, this is another uh, key message. With the debt distress that we're seeing uh, today, uh, with uh, uh, many countries, middle income emerging and definitely low income countries, uh, thinking about uh, debt swaps for nature and for climate solutions is important. Uh, even though debt swaps are a bilateral agreement between countries, but the multilateral system can provide different modalities of thinking about projects that could be part of the debt swaps, and research uh, centers can, can help tremendously, uh, tremendously on that. We have a very active uh, COP agenda. I, uh, I invite all uh, participants uh, to go on the website. We have thematic days uh, which uh, tackle uh, gender adaptation, youth uh, uh, coming in very forcefully, uh, and uh, several initiatives related to agriculture and, uh, and water. Uh, and we're putting together the Sharm el Sheikh guidebook for just financing to basically also show what different stakeholders need to do in order to push uh, finance from pledges to implementation. Thank you. Well, before we close our discussion, we have one more question which we received from the audience from Christina Su in China. Let's take a listen. With many food support programs underway, what needs to be done to ensure good coordination is in place to avoid fragmentation of aid efforts? Axel, the question about the aid coordination. Well, this is uh, one of the, uh, the big challenges. Um, you know, uh, I would say, I would describe often this, there are many good intentions and bad outcomes. That while everybody is claiming good uh, coordination, it's often terribly fragmented. And we will need to be very self-critical, step back and say, what do we ultimately want to achieve? And if we actually keep our minds on that we need to support countries, maybe we can step back and be better coordinated. I think it's very clear that uh, coordination is important, and I would add credibility. There's a lot of talk, and I think uh, it, it doesn't help country is when promises are made and we cannot deliver on them. Uh, there is too much disappointment about this. I think what you are hearing is that in, the, in, in this uh, area of food security, quite frankly, there is no excuse that there is this problem. I think we should also keep in mind that this is a problem where the world community got already together almost 50 years ago, and we said we would solve this problem in 10 years. We're still here. That is, in fact, a scandal and a failure of the international community, a total lack of coordination, and a total lack of action. So we can do a lot better. I think we need to concentrate on this. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, certainly uh, look, when it comes to money, I think we need uh, to avoid that we have 100 funds but a, a couple of few, and, and then a clear results-oriented action. I think uh, many countries know what they have to do, so we need to work with them, put them in the driver's seat, and have a, a, a clear program. But most of it, it is the mindset that we are here together, into it, and it requires international sol solidarity. And what is, I think, missing at, at this stage is, is a lack of solidarity with money and that we have to act on this. And I think that is where we need to push it. There is no excuse that we have this increase of extreme poverty. And, and this is an, a stark reminder that we need to keep behind this kind of discussions often the picture of extreme poverty. Why is it that we have still this? And on that we need to act. And I think we can do it. I think the bank is trying to uh, do it through its program. But as I said, we can only do it together. 
Thank you. Thank you for all the, those answers, dear panel members, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to, for our guests joining us in the studio. It's time now to pause and hear from young people around the world about how this uh, crisis have been discussed, we've been discussing uh, touched, uh, touching their lives in a very dramatic way, about the ideas and the steps that should be taken to develop and build resilience into food and energy systems for their future. Hi everyone, my name is Joni Panti from the province of Catanduanes, Philippines. And it's me, Yasmin Hamdi My name is Seth Ami from Ghana. Mi nombre es Magali Curasimancia de Nacionalidad Peruana del Departamento de Apurimas, Provincia de Bancay. Many families have fallen into starvation and malnutrition because they cannot afford three square meals every day. I have experienced firsthand the, the challenges for food shortages and energy crisis that are facing the world now. I can't provide for my family, I can't sustain my family because my salary now has to be directed onto the most immediate basic basic needs of the family. Hemos perdido poder adquisitivo. Si antes con 6000 pesos, poco menos de 2 dólares comprabas 10 huevos, ahora solo podrás comprar nueve. Affordability is one of the largest barriers to a healthy nutritious diet. The people of my community are also suffering from frequent power cuts and increase in public transport fares. Even here in Norway, where I live, we have challenges with rising energy prices and record high electricity bills, food prices and so on. We have an ongoing war, a pandemic and a climate crisis. We have to act now. Smart farming can reduce hunger in Africa. لذلك من الضروري العمل على تخطيط ومتابعة التدخلات الغذائية لدى الأطفال. Boosting productivity, diversifying production, and reducing waste. Es importante fomentar el racionamiento energético y buscar el desarrollo de fuentes renovables. La energía solar como oportunidad para boostar la industrialización. Urbanización, pollution free environment, conserving the energy sources, along with renewable energy sources, are a few of the factors that will help in solving this grave problem. Nos devons interpeller la jeunesse à participer dans le domaine agriculture. In developing countries like India, on farm solutions for marginal farmers can help. Equipping farmers with knowledge and modern techniques on how to take climate action. There is a need to build forward better. To deal with us. For all, today and in the future. We can only do this together. Salim, I'm Zerina Nurmuhambeto from Almaty, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Now people have been sharing their thoughts on this event online and on social media, and now I'm joined by my colleague Sri Sridhar, who has been following the conversation throughout. So tell us, Sri, what stood out for you. Thanks, Miriam. Great to see you and to see people in the room here today. We've got a great conversation online, people joining across our different social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, using the hashtag for today's event, which is food fuel for all. And they're joining from India, France, Morocco, Cote d'Ivoire, and the United States. But what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the devastating consequences of the high food and energy prices, how the world must look for durable and sustainable solutions to protect people from the impact of these crises. So quickly wanted to share with you one comment that we had come in on Twitter from Ide Patrick, who is saying that the impact of high food and fuel prices is seriously creating a hyperinflation, World economists and financial management need to focus on finding lasting solutions. So it's you know it's it's great to see some of this engagement come in across our channels. Right, and I understand you do have results of the poll. Yeah. So today's poll to remind everyone asked which of these below options do you think contributed most to the global food and energy shocks? And we have five options to choose from. They're going to come up here. Is it A, supply chain issues? Is it B, the war in Ukraine? C, extreme weather events? D, exchange rate volatility? Or E, is it all of the above? So before I reveal the results, Miriam, what is your vote here? 
I would go with E, all of the above. I always like an all of the above answer as well. But let's see the results. And as they're coming in, just sharing, we had nearly 800 people take part in the poll today. So we have 8% of people going with supply chain issues, 23% the war in Ukraine, 7% extreme weather events, 3% exchange rate volatility, and 59% do seem to agree with us are going for all of the above here today. Thank you, thank you so much. So all, all of the above. Okay, I was right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ridon from Dhaka and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meeting. We are nearly at the end of this event on human cost of food and fuel crisis. Let's recap on the main lessons that we've learned. Global shocks to food and energy systems are destabilizing the world economy and pushing growing numbers of people into poverty, reversing hard-won development gains and placing extreme pressure on developing nations. Policy should focus on building international consensus to avoid export restriction that increase, um, that increase food and energy prices, protecting vulnerable communities and promoting investments and innovation to build resilient, efficient and inclusive food and energy systems. The necessary focus on emergency interventions, interventions should not divert policymakers from long-term objectives. A transition to clean energy and resilient food systems is vital to protect people and the planet. We hope you've enjoyed being with us today. We really wanted to bring you into these discussions about urgent, comprehensive and streamlined measures that solutions and solutions to address the food and energy crisis. There is still plenty to come at this annual meeting. So join us tomorrow to learn how investing in education is key to a resilient recovery and for a ministerial discussion on meeting Ukraine's financing needs. And on Thursday, there will be another high-level discussion on financing climate action. You can also watch back this session as well as previous one on promoting inclusive growth and a kickoff event featuring the leaders of the World Bank Group and IMF on addressing multiple crises. You will find them at life.worldbank.org. And if you have any comments on this or any other event at these annual meetings, you can share them with us using hashtag resilientfuture. To everyone here at the headquarters of the World Bank Group in DC and everyone watching us online, thank you for being with us today. Goodbye for now. <laughs>